In this episode, the secret power of lawnmowers, combining a hurricane and complex fluid dynamics to keep your yard looking great. Speakers, you've seen that membrane wildly fluttering, but do you really know how it produces so much sound? Transformers, in case you forgot, they're all that stand between you and that 25,000 volt line that will completely fry your home. And the toaster, it may seem simple, but science has cooked up quite a few surprises in that shiny little box. Like special wires that get so hot, they can almost melt metal. We take things apart so you don't have to. A lawnmower. It cuts and it moves forward. The blade turns at Formula One speeds. The wheels turn at speeds of a baby stroller. What makes the blade and wheels turn? The motor. Just one motor for two completely different movements. It relies on laws of fluid dynamics to create extreme cutting conditions. Even though this metal contraption crawls along at a turtle's pace, it is a generator of hurricanes. A generator of hurricanes? At first sight, it only looks like a generator of a really tiresome household chore. At least it moves forward on its own, thanks to the energy of the motor. As soon as we yank the cord, it begins turning. But it turns far too quickly to transmit this same movement directly to the wheels. If it did, the mower would instantly start racing across the lawn at 120 kilometers an hour. The challenge? Taming the motor's incredible power. <laughs> to start, the movement of the motor is transmitted to a pulley, which turns at the same speed. Then we slow it four ways. First, the pulley transmits its movement to a much larger pulley. It takes several turns of the smaller pulley to turn the larger, second one. The machine's already a little calmer. Second, the transmission belt linking the two pulleys isn't doing a perfect job. It actually slips and slides on the pulleys, intentionally. It's yet another way to calm the beast. Third, the second pulley transmits its movement to a gear of an even larger diameter. The rod at the end turns even more slowly than the pulleys. Fourth, the wheel makes one turn for every four turns of the rod. Thanks to this ingenious setup, lawn mowing has managed to avoid becoming an extreme sport. Together, the pulleys, transmission belt, and gears manage to restrain the power of the motor enough to make the wheels turn 20 times slower. But wouldn't it have been simpler to make a slower motor in the first place? No way. To mow the lawn, we need hurricanes. Creating hurricanes requires a motor capable of turning the blade extremely fast. To say the rotation of the blade moves air is a serious understatement. And all that air isn't just moving randomly. The blade is curved at its extremities and near the center. When the blade turns, these curves generate whirlwinds of air. Whirlwinds that spin at more than 120 kilometers an hour. Hurricane wind speeds. The mini hurricanes straighten the grass blades, which is key for a perfect cut. A fraction of a second later, the blade whips around and chops them at 360 kilometers an hour. Record speed in F1. Cleverly calculated. Oh, but there's more. To get the cut grass blades to their final destination, the lawnmower relies on laws of fluid dynamics. If the door is open, a low pressure zone is created. The air pours into the area where pressure is lower. The cut grass is pulled along and then pushed outside. If the door is closed, the entire dynamic changes. This is mulch mode. Without the low pressure zone to pull them, the cut grass blades remain inside the lawnmower. Swept up by the swirling current, they run into a second whirlwind created by the second curve in the blade. 
If a cut blade of grass measures more than 8 millimeters, it's dragged by the rising air current back up into the blade for another trim. Less than 8 millimeters, and the contact surface is too small to be lifted by the current. The cut grass falls to the ground. Cleverly calculated. A blade that turns at Formula One speeds. This same energy, harnessed, slowly turns the wheels. Mini hurricanes and merciless laws of fluid dynamics. So, in the end, mowing the lawn is about controlling extreme phenomena while barely working up a sweat. All thanks to this small masterpiece of engineering. Lawnmowers aren't the only cool contraptions relying on the laws of fluid dynamics. How that wild fluttering in the heart of a speaker gives us good vibrations. Name the kind of music. Name the sound. If we can hear it, this acoustic enclosure can make it happen. This ordinary looking box has the extraordinary ability to produce any and all sounds. But what exactly is a sound? It's air in movement. Molecules of air that create a wave. These waves travel along, eventually reaching our ears. These are sound waves. A speaker is a wave machine for air. Who knew? All the functioning of this basic looking box depends on the interaction between electric current, a copper coil, and a simple plastic membrane. The current and coil cause the membrane to vibrate. The membrane pushes and pulls the surrounding air. Essentially, it pounds waves into the air. Sound waves. By controlling the electric current that moves this small plastic lining, the speaker can make any sound imaginable. Let's look at how it works. In the enclosure are two speakers, one for low sounds and one for highs. Both have the exact same parts and work the exact same way. A permanent magnet, a diaphragm, just a plastic membrane. Stuck to the membrane, a copper coil. The coil is inserted into the magnet. When the current circulates through the copper coil, it creates an electromagnetic force that pushes on the coil. By changing the direction of the electric current in the coil, we change the direction of that force. So, the coil is pushed one way when the electric current circulates in one direction, and the opposite way when the current changes direction. Since the coil is attached to the diaphragm, where one goes, the other goes too. This interaction is the key to understanding how a speaker works. All of this happens in a fraction of a second because the current changes direction very quickly. Up to 26,000 back and forth times a second. How often the direction of the current changes depends on the sounds the speaker is required to make. Low notes will get the current to move back and forth about 40 times in one second. That means the diaphragm will vibrate 40 times in one second. The faster the current changes direction, the faster the diaphragm vibrates and the higher the sound coming out of the speaker. A small electric circuit in the speaker enclosure directs traffic, sending the proper electrical signals to the proper speaker. Low sounds go to the bigger, low-frequency speaker, while high sounds go to the high-frequency speaker. So, it's by controlling the speed of the changes in direction of the current that we control how low or high the sound coming out will be. Simple, efficient, and cool. What about volume? Well, volume and voltage work very closely with each other. By turning the volume higher, more voltage is sent to the speaker coil. The result? Added voltage boosts the power of the speaker coil's electromagnets. The force that pulls and pushes the coils becomes stronger and movements of the diaphragm bigger. That means sound waves leaving the speaker have more amplitude, making the sounds louder. 
the enclosures also play a big role. The diaphragm pushes and pulls the air in front and behind it as it pounds out the amped up sound waves. But sound at the back of the diaphragm lags a split second behind. So every sound coming out of the front of the speaker has an echo coming from the back. Because echoes would ruin the impeccable sound coming from the front, insulating foam inside the enclosure eats them up. What goes out is loud and clear. It's remarkable to think that inside this speaker is the power to recreate the sound of any instrument from any orchestra in the world. All thanks to simple plastic diaphragms and a few bursts of electricity. Principles of electromagnetism making music. But in the end, speakers are all about good vibrations. Next. You know why those 25,000 volt lines from the plant don't completely fry your house? An electrifying look at how transformers tame power. We'll break down another critical gadget at the end of those long lines. How toasters combine electricity and surprisingly complex technology to toast the perfect piece of toast. You may not even notice it anymore, but it's out there. If it weren't for the buzzing, you might have completely forgotten it exists. The transformer. It's the last leg of the journey for electric current before it zips inside your home. Its job? Are you kidding? Try cutting 25,000 volts down to size. That massively high voltage is the only way to get electric current to travel long distances without losing energy. But if you let 25,000 volts into your home, nothing good's gonna happen it would get pretty ugly. Your appliances would instantly fry. Plus, you'd have to contend with assorted short circuits, fires, and explosions. Which is precisely why the transformer is so handy. The outside of the transformer is not much to look at. The high voltage bushing. It's here that the 25,000 volts arrives. The body of the transformer is just a plain steel cylinder. Finally, there are three low wattage bushings. The 120 volts that runs practically all your household appliances comes out here, along with the 240 volts that runs your oven and dryer. So how do you chop 25,000 volts down to 120 and 240 volts? One word, induction. It's fascinating and really simple. Here's how induction works. The current comes into the transformer and shoots into a copper coil. It's the primary coil. That current generates a magnetic field, and if you put a second coil within that magnetic field, an electric current happens in the second coil. That's induction. Now, if the wire is wound around the secondary coil the same number of times as the primary coil, the current induced in the secondary coil would exactly match the current in the primary coil. But if the wire is wound around half as many times, you get half the voltage. It's as simple as that. So the voltage in the secondary coil is controlled, boosted or reduced by the number of times the wire is wound around the coil. The coolest thing about induction is that all this happens without ever having the two coils touch each other. You can chalk that up to the science of magnetism. In this model of transformer, magnetism has a few more surprises. The first surprise? The transformer contains exactly 70 liters of oil. The second surprise? The coil's copper wires and aluminum leaves are covered in paper. Surprise number three? There isn't just one secondary coil near the primary coil. There are two. Don't worry. We've got it covered. So why oil? It's an excellent insulator and prevents humidity from getting into the transformer. In a nutshell, it protects against short circuits. Since it doesn't conduct electricity, its job is to insulate the components from each other. No argument here. Paper inside a transformer does seem a little strange. But paper soaks up the oil, allowing it to get in between the transformer's tightly packed components. Yeah, oil insulates the transformer, but it would be nowhere without paper. Let's go over it. 
the metal leaves of the coils never touch. They're insulated from each other thanks to the oil-soaked paper. No short circuits to worry about. The 25,000 volt current surges through the primary coil, generating a magnetic field in the metallic core surrounding the coils. An electric current is induced in the secondary coils. But why two secondary coils? Well, because of the number of times the wire is wrapped around the coil, each one generates 120 volts. Two means they can be combined to get 240 volts. And all of this without any of these components ever touching each other. Oh, induction. Simple, efficient, safe induction. There's only one thing left to explain. That constant buzzing. Time to cash in my fancy word coupon. Magnetostriction. It sounds complicated, but it's super simple. It means the metal's vibrating thanks to the alternating magnetic field caused by 25,000 volts. An alternating magnetic field just means its direction keeps reversing itself. With every direction change, the metal bends and regains its shape over and over again. Now you know what all the buzz is about. The toaster. There's no simpler gadget in the world today. Push down the lever and, well, really, what else is there to know? It's so simple, we can operate the thing while groggy and half asleep. No simpler gadget in the world? Don't be so sure. Electromagnetism, electronics, chemical reactions, and extreme temperatures. You better believe it, science is cooking up a storm in this little box. In fact, the toaster generates as much heat as an oven, 25 times larger. And it happens 10 times faster. The toaster relies on electricity to juggle a bunch of jobs at the same time. First, electricity keeps the bread in the toaster. Second, electricity toasts the bread. Next, electricity controls cooking time. And electricity even pops the toast. How does it all happen? Grates hold the bread in place. Heating plates toast the bread. There's a drawer for crumb collection. A magnet, an integrated circuit, and a potentiometer. Pushing down the lever slides the bread downward. The spring holding the bread up is now stretched. Why don't the slices come flying out of the toaster when we release the lever? Electricity's on the job. There's a small V-shaped plastic piece on the lever. As it moves down, it splits apart the two metal strips of an electric switch. The two electric terminals make contact. Current races through and the toaster begins its impressive work. The spring may be poised to fling the bread across the counter, but the current activates an electromagnet at the bottom of the toaster. There's a metal plate hidden under the lever. The magnet attracts the metal plate and nobody moves. As long as there's current, the bread's not going anywhere. Smart stuff. Now for the toasting. Again, electricity's in charge. The electricity shoots through a metallic wire. But the wire offers a lot of resistance. And that resistance is the reason the wire heats up. Not only does it heat up, but it heats up really, really fast. The temperature of the wire blasts to between 600 and 650 degrees Celsius. No joke, 10 degrees more and we could smelt aluminum. This wire is also amazing. It's an alloy of nickel and chrome that can withstand volcanic lava. Instantaneously, heat reaches the bread, which starts to warm up. At this point, very complex chemical reactions begin in the bread and the slices start to darken, also very rapidly. The glucose carbonyl group produces the lysine amino group to produce N-substituted glycosylamines. Okie dokie. No need to remember any of that. What counts is the bread's toasting. But it's situation critical. Why? In order to cook the perfect slice of toast, the heat must not attack the center of the slice. If that happens, the humidity trapped in the center of the bread would evaporate, leaving you with, horror of horrors, dry toast. The trick is to superheat the slices, intensely but quickly. 
The nickel chrome wire is perfectly suited because it reacts in the blink of an eye. Things can still get dicey. Heating the slices that quickly and intensely can lead to carbonization, which is why it's key to pop them at just the right moment. Whose job is that? Electricity again. The toast will pop at the exact moment the cooking time set by the user is up. Cooking time is set by a turn of the browning control dial, which is simply a turn of the toaster's potentiometer. It acts as a valve, controlling the amount of electricity that gets through. An integrated circuit takes note of the amount you choose. The more you turn, the longer the cooking time. Once the appropriate amount of electricity has been fed to the wire, the chip shuts it all down. The current leaves the wire, which loses its red glow. The electromagnet turns off. The spring pulls the toast upward, and guess who's got breakfast? As gadgets go, the toaster's hardly a simple device. It nearly reaches the maximum temperature of a conventional stove, and it can do it in record time. Using basic electric current, it triggers a chain of events that produces toast that's golden brown on the outside and moist on the inside. It's no less than an engineering masterpiece. Perhaps the greatest invention since sliced bread.